Today we're going to examine three aspects of organizations which affect their functioning. The first is external environment, and the other two are technology and organizational culture. Let's start first with the external environment, and then we'll incorporate the other two in so that it fills a uh, complete framework. If we go to the first one. The external environment are the events and conditions which surround and affect the functioning of the organization. Before we go to detailing what exactly they are, the open system model of organizations is useful to understanding all of these factors. And this model borrows very strongly from biology, thinking of the human as an open system. Okay, and you can use that metaphor, I think, to help keep everything in track here. Uh, it means in order to function, there have to be resources coming in from the external environment. And that's clearly true for us as humans. We need to get food and oxygen and all of those kinds of things to keep us going. Uh, and then receiving those inputs, there is some kind of transformation that goes on. The transformation can be physical, as in manufacturing, or it can be intellectual, as in what goes on in accounting firms or education. And then out of all of this comes an output, some good, some service that is then sent back out into the external environment again. And what this model does is it helps us keep a focus on the importance of the external environment. So when we look at this, then we're going to look at the external environment today and major components of it that affect the organization. And then we're going to come in and look at two aspects which are really in the transformation process, technology and culture. How do those affect what transpires within the organization? OK, open systems model. What is it then that affects the organization? If we go to good. OK, seven major factors that we're going to look at in terms of affecting the organization. The first being the general economy that exists. This turns out to be particularly important because it affects available cash for organizations. It affects the labor market. If you look at what's happening today in terms of the economy, we have a particularly good economy. We have particularly tight labor markets right now with unemployment falling to the lowest numbers that have been recorded, at least recorded in years. Incredibly good economy. What does this mean for organizations? Well, it means that they're going to have to pay more for skilled labor. It means that they reach further into the barrel, if you will, and have to do more training if they can't get the skilled labor that they want. It means that sometimes they're casting abroad to get labor. It means that they're offering bonuses to employees who are working there for recruiting for them. Anything to bring the labor in to keep the organization running and producing the goods and services that the economy seems to be demanding at this point. It affects interest rates. If you want to build, the general economy is going to affect that. It affects the cost of raw products. And finally, it's going to affect your ability to sell. If consumer credit goes up higher, people won't be buying quite as much. On the other hand, if lots of people are working, more money to spend. Better for the entire organization. So economy turns out to be extremely important. A second factor, external, customers. Both the ones that you have now in the organization and potential customers that exist out there. Got to always be sensitive to the needs of customers, uh, to their satisfaction with the goods and services that they're getting, and to think about where you could go in terms of developing potential customers. Um, suppliers. 
the resources that you need in order to produce the goods and services. Organizations are extremely dependent on suppliers for reliable delivery, for the various needed resources. If there are shortages somewhere, this is trouble. How are you going to produce something? It's exactly what's happening <clears throat> in some parts of the country right now, shortages. Shortages are occurring because of problems right now with Union Pacific in terms of its ability to smoothly merge the operation of Southern Pacific into its operations. And goods aren't getting delivered to a lot of areas that need them. And that's slowing things down enormously. Fortunately, we're on the East Coast, and we're just not realizing what's going on. But the uh, supplier in this case, you can see, is being very important. Competitors. All organizations vie with other organizations for a share of the pie, for a share of the market. And you have to be sensitive. Again, you have to be aware of what's going on with your competitor. Those that keep in front of customer needs compared to the competitor are going to have the advantage. Typically, when an industry starts, and we can think about lots of different industries. We can think about the computer industry when it started. We can think about uh, cellular phones when they started. You find lots of players in the industry, lots of small entrepreneurs out there, lots of competition. And then as an industry matures, some of those players are going to fall by the wayside. They're just not going to be able to keep up. And it may not be because of the product. It may not be because they can't get the finances in back of them to help them develop where they have to go. It may be that they're going to sell out to some larger organization. But what happens is, as a product matures, the competition usually narrows, and there are fewer and fewer players in the field. So if you think where the software industry was at one time, and all the competition that Microsoft had, and now where the industry is today, and how much of the market they've sewn up, you get a feel for what's going on. And if you think about all the computer companies that aren't around anymore, they've just fallen by the wayside because they simply couldn't keep up with the competition. So this is one of the driving forces in any organization. And to keep abreast of what's going on there, there are units within some organizations that are called competitive intelligence units. Get me the information on what the competition is doing. I'm not talking about industrial spying, although that goes on too occasionally. What I'm talking about is information that is freely available out there. Social factors, yet another of the factors that we need to be concerned about. Social factors really deal with changes in values that go on in the broader community and in the country as a whole. So one of the examples we can turn to in terms of changes in values that would be a social factor is the concern that seems to be prevalent right now with the environment. People want to buy products that are environmentally safe in terms of disposing of them. People want to buy tuna, where the company asserts and attests to the fact that their methods of catching doesn't include catching dolphins along with it. And so we're concerned with endangered species. Anytime a highway has to be built, you have to look at the environmental impact statement to make sure that you're not doing damage to something. We look to see how products were made. Were they made with recycled products? <coughs> and this is something that's, um, that companies bring to the attention of the consumer. It's called green marketing, so that people who are concerned about the environment or just generally socially concerned can make those kinds of choices. In the financial area, 
if you want to invest in a mutual fund and you're concerned with the types of companies you might be investing in, you want to make sure that your mutual fund isn't going into any tobacco companies, you can invest in the socially responsible mutual funds. Another area of marketing, things that are tailored to concerns and values that are going on around there. Another aspect of the environment is that of legal and political factors. This has so many ramifications about our existence that we rarely think about. That as we begin to think about it and those acronyms and the alphabet that regulates our lives, uh, you begin to wonder um, how it is that organizations come to cope with this along with all the other things that they have to do. And yet, it's important. There are things that we want. So regulation of industry is a fact of life. Companies have to meet government standards. They have to meet them in the automobile industry. Failure to meet standards means recall of automobiles if they don't meet certain safety standards. It's certainly true in terms of food. If you will remember, not too long ago, there was a big investigation of a major meat packing house in the Midwest because of contaminated meat products that they were putting out. Food and drug. They're always out there inspecting to make sure that the food that we're eating is healthy for us and it's not contaminated and there are not all kinds of things in it that should not be in it. And they're also overseeing drugs that we take to make sure that as new drugs come onto the market, they're going to be safe. They have to go through incredible regulations and testing. Oh, but that's not all, because we have the Environmental Protection Agency to make sure that our air is clean and our water is clean. And this impacts industry because of the various discharges from manufacturing. Another regulation that goes on. Department of Transportation, Federal Commerce Commission, um, all of these regulating what goes on out there. The airwaves are regulated. You can't go broadcast anything that you want to. Okay, the uh, Federal Communications Commission is in on that one. So you begin to see then how legal aspects and government aspects regulate, have an impact on what industry does. And they're going to have to cope with this. They have units within the organizations to help them cope exactly with this. And then finally, technology. In the broadest sense, we're talking about the way the company converts whatever its resources are into goods and services. But in a narrow sense, we usually think of the machinery that's used to produce all of this. And using the appropriate technology, it doesn't have to be the most advanced technology, but the appropriate technology is what gives an organization, again, a competitive edge in what it's doing. Bringing in technology that's more advanced than can be used isn't going to give an organization any kind of competitive edge. Failure to change leaves industries ultimately behind. There is an entire industry in the U.S. which essentially has almost disappeared because of failure to put resources back into the industry to bring it up to the level it needed in terms of technology. And I'm talking about the steel industry. At one time, if you went through the Midwest, you would see in Youngstown, Ohio, and in other parts, huge steel plants in Buffalo, in Pittsburgh, they're not there anymore. They're not there because other countries had to, in part because of World War II and the loss of the industry to war, had to update the industries. But in the U.S., there was sort of a, well, we were way ahead of the game. We weren't looking at the competition. And now we've lost out. And most of our steel is imported. But there are newer and smaller companies out there that are very flexible and very automated that are thriving in the steel industry. So there is room for it to come back. So technology turns out to be very important. Technology turns out to be important in education. 
But the notion of just tossing computers into the classroom without knowing how to use them and without having the applications that are good for using them doesn't help at all. So the notion of you know, just the most advanced technology, no. The technology that makes sense for the company. If you read about the history of technology, you will find that there are some companies out there that are using technologies that go back 50, 60, 70, and occasionally even 100 years. They're small industries, but they're very stable industries, and the technology that they're using is still suitable for them. They didn't need to change because of the stability of the industry. So it's whatever fits. Well, what do all of these factors combine to make? One of the things that's considered in understanding how well organizations adapt to the environment is this concept of environmental uncertainty. And here, we look at two major dimensions. The dimension of complexity, how many factors does the organization have to deal with, and rate of change, how fast are these things changing out there in the environment. Complexity can be simple, very few factors to be dealt with. For example, I recently read about a steamship company that's operating on the Great Lakes with a steamship that's gone back to, I don't know, the 40s or something like that, maybe the 50s. Same steamship, okay, not changing, not dealing with a lot of factors out there. The technology is remaining the same, probably some change in customers, okay, and just not dealing with a very complex environment. On the other hand, you could have a very complex environment where there are many, many factors that have to be dealt with. Let's take a financial institution as an example. What do financial institutions have to deal with? A bank. Well, they have to deal with the competition. They have to be worried that somebody's not going to swallow them up, for one thing. They have to deal with the economy. They have to deal with um, legal aspects, Securities and Exchange Commission, the FDIC, all of those bank regulators and examiners that come through. They have to deal with political situations because sometimes the politics, who's in office, makes it easier for them to expand. They have to deal with technology. Clearly, that comes through. Where are you going to put all of those automated teller machines? Are you going to put automated teller machines in? So that becomes a fairly complex type of environment that financial institutions operate in. So one dimension. Now, the other dimension, rate of change, can go from static at one end, not too much change, to dynamic at the other end, in which this, it feels as if it's perpetual change. Relatively slow change. Mm, maybe a local newspaper. OK, technology isn't going to change too fast on a local newspaper. Uh, but on the other end, a dynamic change, um, trying to think of, again, investment organizations, the stock market where things are in perpetual change. Well, it turns out, generally, that business loves predictability. Business hates uncertainty. It's very hard to manage uncertainty. Um, in an uncertain environment, you're running uh, an investment firm. And we certainly have seen uncertainty there with the gyrations of the stock market recently. What are you going to tell your investors? How are you going to advise your investors? Uh, what are you going to tell them to buy? I mean, you tell them one thing, and the next thing you know, it's the floor is falling out on it. So predictability is liked. And organizations then need to find some way to manage all of this uncertainty. How do they go about doing it? Well, four major ways of doing it. Organizational structure as a way of managing the environment. What does this mean in terms of organizational structure? Put in units, put in departments that can get the critical information for you that help you reduce the uncertainty. I already talked before about competitive intelligence. Very often, this might mean setting up a corporate library. 
that's getting information for the people in the organization. And you find this frequently happening in financial institutions. Uh, you certainly find it in um, news organizations, which need to have this. Uh, they're going to need background because they're working in a very unpredictable environment. And you never know what story is going to break. And so you have to have a backlog of information that you can readily draw on in that unpredictable environment. Well, having that information available helps reduce the unpredictability of something. You find it in pharmaceuticals, where, again, a lot of information is needed. Or you put in some kind of forecasting unit as a way of trying to help you figure out what's going on. And again, banks use forecasters. In agriculture, obviously, forecasting becomes a very important business because agriculture lives and dies by what the climate is, and you need some kind of help in terms of preparation for it. And so they invest in their own private weather forecasting services to help reduce the uncertainty that goes on. One thing that can be done. Vertical integration. If there's uncertainty out there about suppliers and distribution, buy them up, bring them into the company. So what does the oil industry do? If you think about the oil industry, that is really a great example of vertical integration because they're not only involved in prospecting, looking for oil, but they're involved in drilling, they're involved in refining, they're involved in the distribution of it, and finally the sales of it. So it's end to end, they're taking care of the whole thing. And they don't have to worry about necessarily where the supplies are because they've locked up supplies in a lot of areas. Vertical integration. Movie industry had been there for a while, but has split off on that. At one time, the people who made the movies also distributed the movies and also owned the movie houses. End to end, vertical integration. Mergers and acquisitions as a way of trying to control your environment. It's too competitive out there. First Union Bank is acquiring core states. And we've seen this go on in the banking industry now for quite a while. All of those local banks seem to be disappearing on us. And if you look at what First Union is composed of, uh, there are probably about seven banks that went into that. I'm throwing a figure off off the top of my head. I don't know about the union, but the first part came out of First Fidelity, which was uh, Fidelity Bank in New Jersey, and First something else in New Jersey, and we can keep backing off on those two. So you look at the bank mergers that go on. Uh, before that, about two years ago or three years ago, we saw all of the mergers that went on in terms of news and entertainment. Disney acquiring ABC. Time Warner acquiring Turner Broadcasting. Again, as a way of trying to control the competition out there in the field. So mergers and acquisitions. And finally, strategic alliances. For a period of time, join with your competition if you need to in order to get the resources that you need. You don't need to compete with them all over the world. And the automobile industry is, again, an excellent example of strategic alliances. But we'll pick up a few others besides the automobile industry. General Motors knew that it had to develop a car that could compete with some of the things Toyota was putting out. They formed this strategic alliance with Toyota out in California and started manufacturing a car out there, which is essentially uh, operated with Toyota. And they produce a car under a different name that looks very much like the Toyota Corolla, the Geo Prism, essentially the same car, a strategic alliance. If you go to Edison, New Jersey, off the same assembly line as the Ford trucks comes a Mazda truck, a strategic alliance. Doesn't pay for Mazda to manufacture here. 
but they set up an alliance with Ford to do it. And of course, we do the same things in other countries as well. The other strategic alliances that you see set up in a fairly precarious, or sometimes precarious, area is the oil industry. It's precarious because we rely on about 50% of what we use to come in from foreign countries. The Middle East is a huge producer, but the Middle East is politically unstable. Fortunately, we're not relying on the most unstable of the countries there for oil, and we get a lot of oil from Venezuela and Mexico as well. <coughs> so, we have right now problems relating to Iraq, political problems, but unlike France, which had relied on Iraq for a lot of oil, we weren't relying on Iraq for much oil, and so we could be politically somewhat more independent, but not so independent of some other countries there with which um, we engage in various, again, strategic alliances to get oil. So uh, yet another technique for managing this environmental uncertainty. It started out by saying we were going to look at three areas. We've looked at environment. Now we're going to come inside the organization and take a look at technology. Not technology from the outside, but technology from the inside. Technology consists of the activities, the equipment, the knowledge necessary to transform the inputs into goods and services. In any one organization, there are multiple technologies in place. But what we're really referring to at this point is what is called the core technology of the organization, the major technology that's used for producing <coughs> the goods or the service. And now we need to take a look at some of the dimensions of technology. And we're going to be using two models. The first of the model is one by Charles Perrault, in which he looks at two dimensions. I think I mentioned once before that management loves two by two contingency tables, matrices. And here is yet another one of these two by twos. The first dimension has to do with how routine <coughs> is the task? How many exceptions are there to the task? How repetitive is the task? If the transformation process is standardized, then it's routine, like an assembly line. If the transformation process is varied, as in an R&D laboratory, then it is non-routine. So we have then one continuum going from very routine, standardized, to many variations, non-routine. The second dimension has to deal with problems. Are the problems when they occur easy to analyze, or are the problems when they occur <coughs> very difficult to analyze? As difficulty increases, again, the whole process becomes, the whole technology becomes less routine. Putting these together, there are four different types of technologies that Perot specifies. And we can go into any organization and then by looking at the tasks and the problems, figure out what is the appropriate type of organization for the um, technology that's employed. A routine technology. Routine technology means that there are a few exceptions, it's standardized and that the problems are easy to analyze. McDonald's, an assembly line, typical of routine types of technology. If there are few exceptions, but the problems become more difficult to analyze, then we're dealing with a craft technology. There's kind of a standard approach to what you're doing, but you have to now deal with problems on an individualized type of basis. 
becomes more complicated. What fits in here? Well, perhaps things like tool and die makers. Or even accountants could fit into this classification. Okay, there are certain rules, standardized procedures for accountants, but then they deal with each individual customer who presents problems that are difficult to analyze, so it becomes less routine. The next of the categories is the engineering technology. Here there are many exceptions, but the solutions are standardized. Okay. If I could borrow an analogy from medicine, it's as if the patient is coming in with, patients are coming in with many different types of problems, and the solution is take two aspirins and call me in the morning. A standardized solution to what's going on. So customers bring in to the engineering type of technology, and can think of a large engineering firm or an architecture firm, if you want to, specialized types of problems, but there is a standardized solution to it. You don't have to have lots of different solutions. So uh, you need to build a particular bridge in an area. And you can customize the bridge to a certain extent. But it's off a standard base engineering technologies. And finally, when you get to non-routine technologies, and the example here is always the research laboratory. But you could use an emergency room as well in a hospital. There are lots of exceptions. The problems that, are, that come in that are being faced are individualized, and each one is difficult to analyze. There's no clear-cut solution that you can apply to it. One of the types of technologies. We're going to put this aside for a moment before we consider some of the solutions that come up in terms of organization and go to the next typology, Thompson. Thompson didn't look at the tasks. Thompson looked at how the tasks connected to each other. Interdependence becomes the important term here. And to the extent that tasks are technologically interdependent, there has to be a lot of coordination and integration, then one unit is relying on another unit for information and for resources. You can't get the job done where tasks are technologically interdependent without some kind of input from another unit. It means that, again, the solution to the organizational structure will be different than if there is low interdependence. And Thompson specifies what he thinks are three different types of technologies, a mediating technology. Here things are kind of joined together, but basically units are independent of each other. And he talked about a pooled type of interdependence. A bank is a good example of a mediating technology because a bank brings together depositors, people who want to earn interest on their money, with borrowers, people who need to borrow money, to whom they charge interest. It mediates between the two. An employment agency mediates between people who want jobs and organizations that have jobs that need to be filled. Real estate agencies mediate between people who have houses to sell and people who want to buy houses. Okay, so when you have this kind of mediating technology, people can operate somewhat independently in the organization. There's not too much demand for resources from other people in the organization, although there is some generalized information that's needed. There's not an awful lot of technological interdependence between the units here. If you're a real estate agent, you need to know what the listings are, but you don't need to constantly check back with all the other real estate agents. OK? So mediating. The next type of technology, sequential or long link technology, uses a sequential type of interdependence. Here, one unit is reliant on the unit that's um, adjacent to it for resources, an assembly line. One unit can't complete the task until something moves over from another unit. 
So there is a certain amount of interdependence here. You have to get that resource in order to do your operation. If you don't have it, you've got a bottleneck. Things come to a halt. Again, the solution to the type of integration and coordination is still fairly standardized in this. And then we get to the last and the most complex of the technologies, which is an intensive technology. Here, all of the units need resources and information from every other unit in order to get the job done. As luck would have it, we have a wonderful example of this uh, reciprocal interdependence that just happened two days ago in Des Moines, Iowa. The birth of septuplets. I don't know if any of you have been following this. The McCoy septuplets. Uh, quite an event. I think it's um, only the second time that they've all been born alive that we have on record. Um, four girls, three boys. And the smallest of these seven is two pounds and maybe an ounce or two. That's very large for a septuplet. There were about 40 people in the delivery room to carry this off. Okay, you can just imagine what it must have been like. Uh, in the regular delivery room for normal birth, you've got well, probably about four or five people. And now you've got seven in a cesarean section. Okay, <coughs> very complex. Everybody had to be uh, working with everybody else to carry this off. And amazing. Okay, but you get the feel for uh, everybody needs to be there and, and trade information back and forth with other people and talk to other people. Very intensive in terms of the type of technology. And people need to engage in what is called mutual adjustment. Mutual adjustment in terms of coordination means that things are happening so quickly, you don't have time to rely on a standardized form. You don't have time to go to a manager. You've got to turn around to the person and say, what's happening? So you know what to do. Or you've got to read, if it were in this case, the telemetry that's up there to get the information. Mutual adjustment. You're dealing on the spot with somebody and adjusting. Football teams, another example in which there is reciprocal task interdependence of the various people who are actually on the team. Things are always changing. Things are in flux. And you've got to quickly get the information to other people. Okay, or survey the scene and make sure that you're getting the information that you need from the environment itself to deal with the quick changes that are going on. Okay, so different types of tasks. How do organizations cope with different types of technologies? Oh, okay, we're skipping ahead a little bit. According to Perot, routine technologies call for mechanistic structures, non-routine for organic structures. So you structure the organization to the technology. Analyze the tasks, use the technology. According to Thompson, it tells you what type of coordination and integration you need to have. You can use fairly standardized types of communication for uh, a mediating and a long link type of technology, either standardized or hierarchy of authority, managerial levels. But you need mutual adjustment when it comes to an intensive technology. Now, what you will find if we use a hospital as an example, that there are lots of different technologies that are operating at any one time. And so in a hospital, you can have um, technologies which are pooled at one point, somewhat mediated at another point, and intensive. We already looked at the intensive at another point. All operating, and you can adjust the technologies to the various different units or areas of an organization. It doesn't have to be a standard one for the entire organization. Where this all brings us to today, with the availability of computers, is the need to talk a little bit 
about advanced information technology and how that affects organizations. And here, we're talking about the accumulation, the storage, the processing, and the transmission of data made possible by computers. Information technology is flexible. It gives the organization discretion about how to arrange work. It can be used to enrich jobs. It can be used to de-skill jobs. It's flexible. It can go either way. Okay? And so how it's used in the organization depends on the strategy of the organization. I'm going to look at it in two areas, in manufacturing and in offices. How does it fit in? In manufacturing, the two major areas in utilization where we see it is computer-aided design and computer-aided manufacturing, known as CAD-CAM, and in computer-integrated manufacturing, sometimes known as flexible manufacturing systems. Two areas. Uh, I wish we could take a walk across the hallway and go onto the factory floor and take a look of some of what's going on, but just a very brief introduction to CAD-CAM and computer-aided inter computer integrated manufacturing. CAD-CAM is essentially designing on the computer. You're doing your graphics there. Okay, but you're not just designing on the computer. It allows you to rotate the design on the computer and look at it from different angles. It allows you to zoom in and zoom out. But that's not all. You have kinematics. So now you can take this unit that you've designed and add motion to it. And it has to, if it has to join with something else, you can check to see whether the mating is good on the computer, whether the two pieces are going to stay together when there's motion. You can check for vibrations. And finally, you can generate machine instructions and send it off to the computer-aided manufacturing part, computer-aided design. What does this do away with? It does away with a lot of drafts people, <coughs> draftsmen, okay? We simply don't need that skill, that manual skill, which occupied lots of engineering firms at one time. Computer-aided manufacturing. Now we have machines that can automatically do drilling, boring, reaming, and we can go on and on with all of the things that they can do. And they can change from doing one thing to doing another. Doing these things automatically, you don't need that skilled machinist in front of the machine operating it. And they can change, as we said, they can automatically change uh, from one process to another, change tools that are needed. Skilled machinist is just not going to play the same type of role anymore. Computer-aided, computer-integrated manufacturing, okay, is going to use the computer as a spine for all aspects of manufacturing. For the manufacturing itself, for assembly, and for inspection, and then can change from using manufacturing one thing to manufacturing another item. All automated. You program the whole thing to do this. And it's linking various manufacturing processes together. Well, this really makes for quite a change out there on the factory floor. And things that were skilled before now become automated and fairly routine. So in a sense, we're de-skilling jobs. We'll come back and take a look at that in a minute. But what is office technology? Well, at least word processing, but now text processing has gone way beyond that. Some kind of use of a communication package, email, fax, databases, spreadsheets could be added on, and information storage and <coughs> retrieval. We're storing on disks what used to take up warehouses of space. What happened to the file clerk? The person whose job it was to take all the papers generated at the end of the day and file them away in storage somewhere. That's just automatically folded into the process of preparing the document because you prepare it and you're filing it at the same time somewhere. You have your file set up in some kind of logical way. <coughs> so uh, again, things have changed there. I mean, what does this mean, then, for job design, for manufacturing? Less skill on the <coughs> shop floor. You don't need the skilled machinists out there. You don't need draftspeople out there. 
but it also introduces new jobs. And these jobs probably require, probably definitely require skills in programming. You teach your machinists how to program. You now give them courses in electronics so they can handle new areas that are opening up because these people are needed to a great extent. It's also beginning to blur the task lines between what was mechanical and was now electronic. So, uh, and bl blurring the lines between <coughs> drafting and design, a change there. Um, in terms of office technology, what's going on? How do things change there? Well, initially, some de-skilling probably is going on. De-skilling going on in that if you had a secretary who did a lot of different things, when word processing first came in, because of the expense of the machines, there was a tendency to put a lot of secretaries in a pool. And all they did was text processing all day long. But now, we go from text processing to document preparation. And now we need people who are skilled in a lot of applications. And the more applications they're skilled in, the more salary they can command out there. So what starts out initially as de-skilling in the job itself, now we adds on possibilities in different areas. And so before you might have just done typing, and now you think about document design. At first there was one font, and now you think about how things are going to look in different fonts and different spaces, and you can add graphics in, and you can come up with a really interesting document out there. Okay, this is something that secretaries didn't do before. But now the facility is there. You might have sent the final document off for printing to someplace else. Now, desktop publishing. Okay, so new skills are needed and called for in all of this. And what does it do for the structure of the organization, for manufacturing? Flatter organizations, more flexible structures. Increased need for coordination goes on in these sorts of things. And it may be because we're seeing actually the blurring of task areas that the notions of functional areas are not going to be so useful to us anymore in projecting where we go in the future with this. As people, because of computer-aided and computer-integrated manufacturing, begin to wear a lot of different hats, it may be that the old areas just don't matter so much. So new structures, perhaps, in the future. We're not there yet. But it certainly is making some difference right now. Office technology, again, flatter. Because all of these organizations, with the advent of the computer, allows people to do their jobs faster, better, with fewer people. So flatter and more decentralized offices. The effect on job design. Technology, big impact. And we have yet the last dimension which we need to consider. Organizational culture. The cognitive framework of attitudes, values, norms, and expectations shared by members of the organization. If technology is something that you can reach out and touch, culture surely is not. It is one of those intangibles that exists out there, and yet it has an impact on how things are done in the organization. Let's look at some of the dimensions of culture, ways that we can differentiate various organizations. One of the dimensions is innovativeness. And this is the value that an organization attaches to being creative and to being innovative. Some organizations want things done in a standardized way. Tradition is valued. Other organizations value creativity the difference in culture. Another is stability. How much change is valued? How much risk is valued in the organizations? Some organizations are going to value taking gambles, educated gambles, but gambles and risks. And others, no. Very conservative in approach. And you find, looking at some investment houses, here's clearly a way that we can distinguish things. 
But you can also distinguish it sometimes in retail establishments as well. You walk into one establishment and it feels the way it's, it's been that way since you, know, you were a little kid. Nothing has changed there. And others are much more innovative uh, and are doing lots of different things. People orientation. To what extent is value attached <coughs> to fair treatment of people and to what extent is value attached to being supportive of people? People orientation, again, can run the range. Results orientation, how achievement oriented is this organization? We'll pick up on that when we talk about symbols. Informality, how easygoing is the organization? Is it a buttoned up organization? Not too much joking around? Everybody wears the buttoned up suits? No dress down Fridays? Okay, or is there a lot of informality in the organization? So um, people don't mind if you come in in your jeans and sweatshirt in terms of working there. Conscientiousness, the value attached to attention to detail in an organization. They're going to be on your back all the time because you haven't dotted your I's and crossed your T's. Some again, are more relaxed about this and others focus on this. In some organizations, maybe you have to focus on it because detail makes the difference. And collaborativeness, how team-oriented is an organization. So we can look at these values and distinguish organizations. Having been able to distinguish them and knowing that there are real differences in working from one organization to another, how is this culture transmitted? through symbols and slogans. Quality is job one. Progress is our most important product. IBM is big blue. Okay, The various uh, logos that are attached out there, and organizations spend a lot of money on their logos. The golden arches are so visible. And people immediately key on the golden arches when they're on the highway and traveling and know exactly what it is. And know that when you go there, they know what they're going to get. That logo stands for something. Stories. This is how it used to be in the old days. And there are stories that evolve in various organizations. Ceremonies. Special events that go on in organizations to celebrate certain corporate values. One of the hospitals that, I'm not exactly sure what the status is in Newark, because it has been taken over by St. Barnabas, but I think it still goes by Beth Israel. When you go in there to get a feeling of the culture of the organization, they talk about being a member of the Beth family. It says something about there in terms of people orientation and in terms of integrating people into uh, feeling very loyal to the organization. An example of culture. Mission statements, actual statements that tell you what the values and the orientation of the organization is. Sometimes principles are there for people to read. And of course, you learn the culture the same way that you learn norms through social learning. We absorb it by watching what goes on in an organization and watching what people value and what people do. So a number of ways. What is the impact of all of this? on the organization. The first distinction that we have to make is between strong and weak cultures. Strong cultures are cultures where everyone can agree about that aspect of the culture. Everyone agrees that the organization places value on innovation, or everyone agrees that the organization is person-oriented, or everyone agrees that it's achievement-oriented. Strong cultures, obviously, are going to have more of an effect than weak cultures, because when people can't agree as to what the value is, then what kind of an impact does it have? None. Very little. And the impact somehow affects the behavior of people in the organization and choices that they make. If an organization 
is achievement oriented, if you walk into the lobby and you see on the hallways of the lobby all of the various awards that the organization has won, if you walk into people's offices and they have their own little awards up and they're talking about all of these things, the culture is clearly achievement oriented and there's a push to produce results that has an impact on the performance of people in the various units. It tells them how to set their priorities. What are the things that they should focus on in the organization? Let's take a small example, and that is universities that focus on teaching versus universities that focus on research. The culture becomes really evident to people in the organization in terms of how they focus their priorities and where they're supposed to be spending their time. Now, at NJIT, of course, we focus on both, so we get excellence in both categories. Uh, finally, person-organization fit, a relatively newer concept that exists out there. But the idea here is that people don't come into organizations as blank slates, but they bring with them their own sets of values. And how well they're going to succeed in an organization depends on the fit between the person's values in the organization and the values that already exist in the organization. If you are a more easygoing person in an uptight organization, it's not going to be a good fit. And one of the things that indeed the research indicates are those people whose values do fit with the organization tend to remain with the organization longer. They are more comfortable there. So one of the things that you need to consider as you're going out there and you're engaging in job searches is finding out something about the culture of the organization and how that culture is a match for your own values so that you wind up in an organization where you're feeling comfortable, where you're feeling that you can continue to progress there. Another aspect of culture which gets reflected is that of ethics, and yet something else that you need to ask yourself, a very important question. Are you going to be pressured by the organization to engage in certain things that are going to leave you feeling as if you can't look at yourself the next morning in the mirror? Are they going to cut corners on things? To the extent that you can find out about something like that, again a match. And so, we've examined environments, we've examined technology, we've examined culture. We've looked at person-organization fits. One of the things that makes for stress in an organization is poor organization, person fit, and next time we take a look at conflict, stress, and its resolution. <laughs>